Today we'd like to talk about fecal incontinence. And in order to understand fecal incontinence, the best way is to start by defining terms. Usually when we talk about fecal incontinence, we're talking about loss of solid and liquid stool. Just losing gas or passing gas without control is really flatal incontinence. So anal incontinence is divided into flatal incontinence and fecal incontinence. Um, there are different types of fecal incontinence that include urgency, seepage of stool, as well as passive loss of stool. So I guess you're wondering why am I uh, learning about fecal incontinence? Because it actually involves many, many phases. In particular, it can affect certain things such as sex, your job, and social issues. So, when we talk about this, the incidence overall is probably in the neighborhood of 0.4 uh, all the way up to 18 percent. And while that seems like a big gap, that's because that people don't report it well, um, not published all the same, and so when you do that, if you take out the biased and, and try to validate most likely it's in the neighborhood of being around 11 to 15 percent. When you compare it to other kinds of issues in pelvic floor disorders, probably overall, pelvic floor disorders is probably the most common, which is greater than urinary incontinence. Uh, then comes the fecal incontinence, and then lastly, uh, more common than pelvic organ prolapse itself. When we try to uh, decide how we want to evaluate a patient, I think it's best to first understand just the basic anatomy. So understanding uh, the basic anatomy, I think you can start uh, with pretty much a simplistic picture uh, of what is controlling uh, the fecal incontinence. And we look at that, there are basically three levels. There's a level up in the brain, there's a level in the spinal cord, and then finally there's a local level. When we look in the brain, it's going to come out of sensations. This is where things are communicated first from a local level back to the brain. The brain then communicates down the descending track. So it's coming up the ascending track to the brain. The brain interprets and then sends it back down the descending track. Now, this is all based on sensations of what's happening within the rectum. Um, when we look at this, as the rectum begins to feel, it begins to expand, that's where information is going to be fed up the ascending track, interpreted by the brain as time to go or no. And then they're going to come back down and give that signal as to whether or not the anatomy should relax and allow for defecation or whether you should defer that until a more appropriate time. When you look at the fecal, the fecal incontinence mechanism, it's basically divided into an internal anal sphincter, an external anal sphincter, and then the uh, puborectalis, and subsequently the neural pathway that we just described. In particular, these, the sphincters of, of noted significance, if this is the rectum, there is an internal sphincter that's a, a circumferential sphincter uh, that goes around the distal end. However, there is a large uh, external anal sphincter that kind of has an overlapping fashion. Now, these are fed by the uh, external anal sphincter is fed by the inferior pedendal as why by the internal is fed more by the hypogastric plexus. plexus. It's under autonomic and spinal control. When we start to talk about what's involved in that control, we start to talk about pathology. So what is actually wrong when you start to lose stool? Uh, we start to lose stool because there's a problem with the anus, there's a problem with the rectum, there's a pro problem with the nerves, and certainly the stool itself could have issues. So when we start to talk about the anus itself, we think about cancer, we think about congenital problems, rectal prolapse, fistulas, and certainly obstetrical injury. In the rectum, again, we think about cancer, ischemia, inflammatory bowel disease, or radiation problems. 
neurology uh, problems that can be central or can be uh, peripheral, such as stroke, dementia, spinal cord problems, multiple sclerosis, diabetic neuropathy, called equina problems. And then finally, the stool itself. The stool consistency, if you looked at the number one cause of fecal incontinence, it's going to be due to diarrhea. So a chronic diarrhea or a loose stool is going to be the main reason that people have fecal incontinence. If you can treat that diarrhea, firm up the stool, typically you can have better control of fecal incontinence. Certainly other stool problems can cause incomplete evacuation or a sense of rectal urgency, but in evaluating such things as malabsorption, antibiotic uses, medications, these are all going to be important in evaluation of fecal incontinence. So overall, when you start to look at risk factors, you have to stop and think, what's the most common of these pathologies? Certainly uh, uh, fecal incontinence is more common uh, in women than it is in men. It uh, can be associated with an increased uh, body mass index. Uh, it's more common with obstetrical injury. And uh, although it is not normal, increased age uh, also increases the risk of uh, fecal incontinence. Also think about things, the drugs that the, the patient may be on, such as uh, things that alter uh, sphincter tone, calcium channel blockers, uh, serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, antibiotics, laxatives, um, anticholinergics can all play a role in uh, loss of stool. In evaluating, uh, I think one of the easiest things is to take a patient's history. When we think about the history, think about a diary, just like you would for the bladder or menstrual diary. Uh, and then a, uh, there's also questionnaires, and probably the best way is when you lose stool, something smells fishy, or use the fishy uh, uh, survey, which is a fecal incontinence survey. Uh, it also talks about the in, uh, impact on quality of life. When we're doing our physical exam, uh, it's going to be very similar to what you do, would do for any other pelvic floor. You want to check out for those things that we've just discussed. Neurologically is going to be one of our big keys. And certainly digital rectal examination, vaginal examination, skin changes, especially looking for skin breakdown due to the loss of stool. Look for uh, the anus in particular to see if it's patulent. Um, look at levator tone, so look at your levator ani. Uh, certain testing may be of significance. Probably the uh, if you think about one of the biggest tests that you can do, it's going to be the digital rectal examination. So this digital rectal examination is of great importance. The digital rectal examination has been as proven as reliable as just doing anal rectal manometry. So let's talk about uh, anal rectal manometry just for a second. Uh, anal rectal manometry is very similar to doing urodynamic studies. In other words, you're testing pressures, except the catheters are in motion, where you pull those catheters down different areas of the rectum and anus and measure pressures and sensations. However, probably one of the first tests that you would want to use before beginning treatment is uh, doing uh, uh, endoscopic evaluation with anoscopy um, or proctoscopy. Anoscopy looking at the very distal proctoscopy, proctoscopy looking up into the rectum. Uh, probably it may help then, after you've done that, to do an anal rectal manometry. And then some possible things that may be uh, uh, of consideration would be uh, defecography, uh, pedendal nerve testing with an EMG, um, transanal ultrasound, um, or uh, an MRI, such as a 3D dynamic MRI. Defecography is basically allowing the patient uh, to sit in a chair um, uh, during which time um, they're allowed to uh, defecate, and this is caught on a fluoroscopy. Um, this is typically done with uh, radio opaque dye, sometimes mixed with uh, oatmeal or other ingredients so that it can get a more thick consistency. Uh, neurophysiological testing with EMG or pedendal nerve uh, can test uh, from the time it's stimulated to go up and again return back down uh, the descending pathway. Um, uh, this has come under some 
a uh, question as to the uh, reliability and reducibility, reproducibility. Uh, it may not be as great value as we once thought. Uh, finally, transanal ultrasound, and just to refresh your memory, uh, in a transanal ultrasound, there's the central portion where the probe is. There's going to be a dark circle uh, where the intrinsic, excuse me, where the internal sphincter is. And then finally, a, a larger white area uh, where the external anal sphincter is uh, versus that of an obvious discrete break versus that of possibly an area of attenuation, uh, but without that discrete break. Um, transanal ultrasound can easily be performed in the office without too much uh, issue. A 3D MRI can also tell you about uh, the anatomy, however it is more costly and sometimes not available in your center. Um, but these are the main tests uh, that will help you. But again, uh, probably the best test to use is a good old-fashioned uh, digital rectal examination. We'll go more into uh, treating once you've made that diagnosis on the next se series. Uh, that concludes the diagnostic evaluation.